And one of the preachers, an influential man, at least he has lots to say, got up with a red face, walked out, and they told me later he blew his top about this beautiful nonsense of the Lord standing in the midst. Well, he, he stirred up a little uh, agitation there among a few preachers. And of course, next meeting I was there again. I knew that this man, well, he's one of those strong personalities. He could make a peck of trouble for me, and did. But before I went to the meeting, I went to the Lord. He's all right. <laughs> I said, Lord, now you know this fellow will be in the meeting. You know what he done did yesterday. He blew his top up in the kitchen so forth. Now, Lord, I said, you've just got to help me. And the Lord gave me a song. Uh, it's impossible for me to describe to you the intensity of it. But within me, there was, of course, the glow of his presence. And within that, a song so strong going around and around all the time while I sat on the platform, while I ministered, even though this man sat in front of me and I knew how he felt. The spirit through that song just lifted me above this whole situation so that I was able to carry on as though nothing had ever happened. Now the other evening on Wednesday when the faculty had their get-together, uh, Mrs. Wells was asked, to sing this song for us and it so thrilled me especially in view of what it has meant to me in times past that I've asked Sister Wells to sing it for us this morning. Sister Wells, this is your turn. My favorite and I've sung it so many times but just now the Lord is making it even more real to me. My Heavenly Father watches over me.
Now then I want to take you to the Gospel of Luke this morning. As far as I know, I do not have another uh, meeting scheduled with you. Of course, we're here Sunday evening, but then that's something else again. And I realize that we're coming to the parting of the ways now very rapidly. EBI is changing her complexion. Uh, we are going to be scattered to the four winds before very long, especially with the seniors, of course, leaving. And you can be sure that once that has taken place, some of our ways will never cross again. That's right. Surprising how some disappear. You never see them again, only it seems only a minority you meet now and then. And in regard to all of us, we're scattering. And only God knows what is lying just ahead. The world situation is extremely ominous. If I air it up, this spaceship the Russian threw into orbit weighs 3,000 tons. That's in my mind. If I'm in error, it's just a mistake. But it seems to me that's what they said. Of its military capabilities, nobody is in doubt. That is when it's fully perfected. The world situation has never been as critical in all its history as it is today. Everywhere you look, there is upheaval. The saints seem to have a rougher time to keep saintly than ever before. And I don't feel like a pessimist, but I would like to be a realist. And as such, we can hoist the flag this morning, the signification of which is Stormy weather ahead for most of us, maybe all of us. Now I want to read to you from the Gospel of Luke something I felt the Lord was working in me on for you. When it comes to the end of the year, there are a number of things one would like to say to a group while we have them all together. But then you cannot do that. Reading from Luke 6, 47 to 49. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not <coughs> is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Uh, every year at this time, I feel, of course, as any other instructor would, the uh, implications of being scattered, you wonder what you did and what you didn't do, what you should have done, and so forth. This morning I want to give to you a rather sober line of thought. Uh, cannot help but have the seniors in mind primarily, that's a habit of mine, I'm just made that way, I suppose others feel the same way. In a sense now, this morning, we are houses. We are different kinds of houses, to be sure. 
And by these houses of ours, or that which has been wrought, shall we say for these one, two, or especially three years, you may be quite confident will soon be put to a severe test. That's right. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you already begin to see the first signs of a hurricane. Things can blow awfully hard. I'm wondering in my own mind now how well we have built and what kind of a foundation we have built. You will find in this parable of the Lord, he compares two kinds of houses. As far as I can see, there seems to be no indication of any basic difference in these houses. The writer does not assume any structural uh, difference or a difference in design whatsoever. He simply talks about two houses. These houses, they were seemingly built alike. They were subjected to the very same test. Note that what is said of the one house that stood is also said of the other house that fell. One house stood and the other fell, and as you read the description, the storm which beat against those two houses was identical. The Lord is picturing both houses subjected to the same kind of a test. The winds blew, the waters beat against that house. If you ever seen a flood, whew, how those waves can beat. I remember a stormy scene down in Valparaiso, Chile, in the South Pacific, after a storm. We went down to the shore to watch the works. Oh, those waves came along and they bent against those buildings and they smashed against those buildings. Some of the water came up in the middle of the road. Here over there was the ocean and the water shot up like a geyser from the road. Uh, nice buildings, right built at the shore. They just crumbled like so many matches from a box. They just went down and these waves came really endlessly. Uh, mercilessly, with a big boom, they hit those things. The water splashed in the air. Who what a sight. Down. Others didn't. And just a little bit beyond, and I'm hoping I'm not painting things too black, but I feel awfully serious this morning. I've got a hurt in my heart, somehow. An ache, that's better. Ahead of us, there are going to be some mighty big waves. Strong winds, they'll bang away at what we said we had. And their nature is so diverse sometimes from our anticipation, things occur so unexpectedly that you wonder where you're at. Well, what about these houses? You know, of course, already that the reason one house stood was because it was built on, a, on an adequate foundation. And you already know, as well as I do, that the other house fell because it was built upon the sand. Now, what attracts my attention here is the character or the nature of this foundation. Here the Lord is giving us, at least that's what I see, three basic elements or layers if you prefer three essential parts of a foundation necessary to make a stand against the storms that blow against our Christian experience. We know we have EBI graduates who have backslid, so have other schools. 
Something went wrong, something wasn't right, somewhere the foundation wasn't solid. I myself am afraid of a number of our students. I don't see how they're going to make it. They'll have to do some picking and face and some building. That's my judgment. Whosoever cometh to me, now notice what the Lord is indicating here. I see in verse 47 three integral parts of a foundation, three absolutely essential parts without which or any one of them we cannot stand. You will find that the Lord speaking about a house built on the sand states categorically that the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it collapsed into great ruin. And as we are subjected to the strains and stresses that are yet to come, there are three things that I want to enumerate to you. And some folk in this chapel would be better off if they listened. One, whosoever cometh to me. Now what you have here is relationship. Whosoever cometh to me. One of the essential things, and I would judge the first one in order, in sequence, is coming to him, the idea being having a proper personal relationship with him as a person. You recall that I have said more than once in times past, when the Lord called his disciples, it reads like this, and he called unto him whom he would, that's your sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, that they should be with him. The trouble is, we put the emphasis on the going, forgetting that the going comes out of the being with him. I've said to all of you before, our first calling is to be with him. We cannot go unless we are with him. We cannot preach unless we are with him. First we are with him, then we are sent by him. Now this uh, being with him or this having a relationship, personal relationship, is not a matter of mere acquaintance. It is one thing to be acquainted with the Lord. It's another thing to have a personal relationship with him. Now here in Luke 13, 23, the Lord was teaching, and one of them said, Are there few that be saved? Isn't it something? How easily people get interested in statistics. Here this man was unsaved, Yet he wants to know how many are going to be saved. He forgets all about the primary fact that he needs to be saved and he ought to be wondering whether he'll be one of them. It doesn't dawn on him to say, Lord, will I be saved? No. How many will get into the kingdom? Strange, isn't it? How our interests are deflected from prior things to secondary issues. How people will argue, for instance, about the time of the rapture. Argue about the time of the rapture. What's the difference? 
The main thing is to be ready when it does take place. When it takes place, it's of secondary importance to me anyhow, and I think to God. People out here losing the victory get mad at each other, debating whether it's before the tribulation, the middle, or the after. Well, they better look out. <laughs> we get so easily distracted with secondary issues, and so this man. Lord, how do you feel that I say? I like the Lord. The Lord answered him and said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. In other words, in other words, never mind how many are saved, you get in. That was the real issue. You get in. Now notice in 25, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. And thou hast taught in our streets. In other words, Lord, we have a personal acquaintance with you. Why, do you remember we sat down in Horn and Harvard restaurant and I brought you a cup of coffee and a piece of pumpkin pie? You remember I sat right across from you at the table and we talked about different things? Yeah, you remember it was in my house? And by the way, Lord, when you healed that woman, you did that right in front of my house, right at the corner. You were standing on my sidewalk. I'll get in, won't I? The Lord says, why, I don't know you. Why, Lord, don't you remember me? I was there. I don't know you. God save us from having a mere acquaintance instead of a personal knowledge of him. They thought they'd make it through a casual acquaintance. But the Lord said, mm -hmm. and when he says in this parable here about coming to him, he doesn't mean as a casual acquaintance, but into a relationship which is a vital reality. Again, in John 6:45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Anybody not taught by God is still untaught. And I don't care how many doctrine books you can memorize. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh to me. Do you know that the object of Bible teaching is not knowing, but coming? Do you know the object of teaching you is not knowing? Or shouldn't we know? Of course we should know. But that's not the goal. The goal is coming. The truth we learn is to bring us to him. And until we come, until we commit ourselves to the implication of the truth, we haven't learned. And if we make a hundred in the first. That's right. We tend to make knowing the goal, but that's an intermediate stopping point. What we know is to bear upon our will to bring us into the implication of that truth. Whoever has learned, therefore, who, uh, every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned, cometh unto me. The final test of what we've learned is not the great we make, but whether we come, whether we respond to the truth and to the person of the truth. 
we stop short in our learning process. Every man therefore that has heard and has learned. Oh, I learned I got a hundred. Wait a minute. Of the Father. Come up to me. Have you come? Come. Oh, then you haven't learned. You only gathered information. You know there's a difference between gathering information and learning? The gathering of the information is necessary to the learning, but it's not complete in itself. And the proof of the learning is the coming to the person of the truth. All the truth is to bring us to him who said, I am the truth. So that through the truth there needs to be, there ought to be a constant transformation unto him. And the final test is coming, not knowing. That's right. The final test is coming. Response. Sometimes somebody says, why, I heard that before. I know that. <laughs> what have you done with it? Nothing. Then you don't know. Do you know why God brings the same truth over and over and over? Not because the hearers haven't heard, neither because they do not know, but because they have never responded. They know, but they don't respond. And without response, the truth is barren. So he sends truth in an effort to cause somebody who has known but the end of truth is not knowing. It is coming. And the end of the coming is a person. And he is the person. That belongs in the, this foundation that will hold you when the waves dash against you with a roar and a bang or tremble but you stand. That's right. Did you get there? That goes right way down where the foundation is anchored. This man here, of this kind of a believer, the house that stood, it says of him that he digged deep. There was an excavation process. Now, well, Luke 14. Are you thinking? You've got to think. 25 to 30. I might skip a little if I can. A great multitude went after the Lord and he turned. I'm so glad for the honesty of the Lord. You couldn't hear him say it's fun to go to church, it's uh, fun to be religious. No, no, he told the people the truth. There's a difference between fun and joy. If I want fun, I don't go to church, I'll go to a clown. The only thing is a clown doesn't, I see nothing funny in a clown. More and more as I get around, I find that, well, here's the situation. As soon as the young people's meeting is finished and they make it short, they go down to the town to the bowling alley. Say, so, hey, we're coming a long ways from where uh, the foundation, our great fathers, our fathers have laid. When you got what I'm talking about, you're not interested in bowling alleys. You won't even have time for it. We better do some digging. And dig the alleys out and some other things. And build a foundation where we can stand. Only God knows, knows what you folk will have to go through before you are three score and ten if you ever get that. Only God knows. Well, we could say, of course. Oh, look on the world situation. It's 
far as I'm concerned, there is no time to fool around. Here a few weeks ago, we had such a beautiful visitation of God. And I think that the last two weeks, we had more breaking of roots in this school since the 21 years I've been in these halls. You wonder what's happening to people. After such an exquisite revival, you think people shun those things. Some of us better do some digging fast. A storm, stormy weather ahead. This man dig deep. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. Do you notice how incongruous our present Pentecostal way of thinking is with the thinking of the Christ? Hating his own life also. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you go and kick yourself. But it simply means that uh, we say no to the demands of the self-life in order to say yes to the Christ. That we allow nothing to stand, no claims to stand between us and his claims upon us. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Not may not, or will not, but cannot. It's impossible. Now we're taking the cross and ditching it and picking up the golf bag in its place or something. Now I'm not talking about wholesome recreation. You know what I mean. For which of you intending to build a tower Sitteth not down first and counteth the cost. In those days they counted the cost first, now they just go into debt. <laughs> My other things have changed. Don't worry about paying. Just borrow money from the bank, pay installment if you don't have if you don't owe anybody, you got no credit. That's the new philosophy. You only have credit if you owe money and have met your payments. If you pay on a go, as you, uh, pay as you go basis, you've got no credit. You'll have trouble getting a loan. Have you had any loan before? No, I've always paid my way. Sorry, sir, you've got no credit. The man who pays has no credit and the man that owes a lot. Strange. Well, the Lord believes in counting the cost. Well, I'll trust the Lord. Yeah. Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. How many of you have begun to build one year and you're not finishing two years and you decide to call it quits now i know there are exceptions if a t if a student of two years has a boy and he's graduating they want to get married why should she come back a third year by herself doesn't make sense except nonsense to me i'm not talking about cases I'm talking about those who ought to, in God. This man, or this girl, this boy, began to build and was not able to finish, didn't have what it took. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, cannot be my disciple. Now what I'm getting at is this. This kind of a relationship of which the Lord spoke when he said, Whosoever cometh to me, that kind of a relationship 
necessitates renunciation of ourselves, of our life. It involves a complete abandonment unto him without reservation or qualification without which an individual cannot stand the onslaught of things without bringing catastrophe to their house. Not mere acquaintance, personal relationship so that those who have heard and understood come everyone who hasn't learned doesn't come the coming or the not coming is the proof of what we have learned or not learned not the test paper the final proof we need the test paper but I'm speaking of the audience. And the final analogy, that's the test. That's not nice, is it? Well, that's it. Again, to the second one now, in Luke 6, 47. And do with them. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and heareth, my sayings, not do with them I should have read, but uh, this other one. And hear my sayings. Now the word sayings here refers to the things which Christ taught. And in order to build that foundation of truth, and bless your heart, we sure need to know the truth. That building of the foundation in this case begins with an attitude. Do you recall in Matthew 13 the, Lord, uh, the Lord's words were rejected because of a wrong attitude? They were astonished at his teaching. They recognized he had something to say. They said in verse 54, Whence hath this man this wisdom? Isn't he the carpenter's son? His sisters are in there with us. Where did he get all of that? And they were offended. Do you know that these people, of course you know you have Matthew, uh, do you realize that these people were offended and did not learn what Jesus said, though they heard what he said? because of a wrong attitude. Well, we know his teaching is, but where does he get it from? Who is he? Carpenter son? Why, we went to school with him. We know his sisters. Wow, him. Oh, go on. And they went their way. Do you know that the right attitude, do you realize it? A right attitude is essential to right learning. The other day I corrected a test paper. I had long felt that this particular fellow had no use for Butler, which of course uh, is to be uh, expected. I knew he was at least more than of average intelligence. But I shall remember his face and he, the way he sits in class for a number of years to come. Quite a number, I think. Sitting there, bright, oh yes, disinterested, indifferent, giving you the feeling. <laughs> I corrected the paper the other day, and what a Poor return. I don't know how many points were lost. Quite a set of them. Ten off, ten off, ten off, ten off, ten off. One of, uh, what I consider one of the brightest fellows in the school. Well, how come? Attitude. Some folk are so bright that they hold such disdain that they don't even learn. 
what is open because of attitude. Now I have other reasons for saying what I do say, of course. The right attitude is essential to right learning. In Matthew 22, 29, Jesus made this statement, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, neither the power of God. These people to whom the Lord referred erred for two reasons. Not knowing the Scriptures, and not knowing the power of God. Now look here. You can err not knowing the scriptures even though you know the power of God. And you can err knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God. These men erred knowing neither the scriptures nor the power of God. We need both. And those of us that are so interested in the gifts and in manifestations and in the presence of God, we need to remember that you err with that unless you have a good, sound knowledge of the principles of the Word of God. We need a knowledge of truth as well as the knowledge of the power and vice versa. In either way, If we lack either one, our foundation is inadequate and cannot stand the test. Do you remember the statement of Galatians? Of course you do. Though an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which I have preached unto you, let him be a person. So sure was Paul of what he believed. You and I have to be sure and convinced of the truth that nothing and nobody can shake it. The devil will sure come around and shake you if he can. But we don't need to be shook. Excuse the grammar. We don't need to be shook. We can stand the flood speed vehemently against it. Oh, they're pounding. Pounding after pounding. Wave after wave. And while you may tremble, you stand because you know the truth. What would we do here if we weren't sure about some things? This foundation involves a doctrine which knows, you can say, thus saith the Lord. Brother Swift has his own teaching on Revelation, as some of you probably know. Of course, he indoctrinated me, and I have never been able to change from it in my own position. He was saying some things, teaching in one particular church, and a young lady who had presumably quite a bold mouthpiece, though she'd hardly do it, she challenged Brother Swift on something. I think it had to do with the rapture. And Brother Swift said to her, now, you give me your scripture. Oh, she says, I have to go home first and get my notes from Bible school. Do you have to go home first and get your notes from Bible school, or can you say, thus saith the Lord? See what I mean? Second rate, second hand knowledge won't do, even though you did learn it from us. You got to know it for yourself so that even though we change, you'd still stand. I stand today on things my teachers taught me in Bible school and they have changed their whole philosophy. I have never changed it. They so convinced me. Some of my teachers in CBI today are repudiating what they have taught me. I still repudiate their repudiation. 
Because back there when I listened to them and I've been before God in prayer, he impregnated those truths in my heart and they became so rooted. The wind comes along and shakes it and tears the leaves off. And when the leaves are off, the tree still stands and grows new leaves. <laughs> Why, sure. Sure. What they taught me today is heresy. And yet they convinced me because they ministered unto the anointing of the Spirit and I poured over this book and I took this Bible on my bed and read over and said, Lord, that is hallelujah. That's why I am incorrigible. I can't throw out the things I was taught in those years. They have taken root too deep. We need conviction in these days. The winds are blowing. Cyclones. Sometimes you hardly know where you're at. You think the wind is blowing east and then it's blowing west. Can you stand the winds out there? When you get into the current, oh, they'll be there. They're there, all right. Hi, how some folk change. The things they avowed and did go, they'd never give up. It wasn't two years before they did. Why, well, everybody believes it this way, and it's too much trouble to stand up, so you just go along with it. Well, there you are. Supposing your master had done that, he stood up against all the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and the people and incurred their enmity. How come he stood up? He heard from God. And even though we teach you, you still need to hear from God. And if you don't hear it from God, that hearing isn't going to take you far. Some things I heard from God, I don't give them up, neither for you nor for anybody else. I, you're not asking me to, but you know how I mean that. When you heard, Jesus heard. And when you hear, oh, you got something. That'll make you stand. Praise God. That's why Paul could say, Thou an angel from heaven. If an angel had come with a big flaming sword, Paul, I got another gospel. That said the Lord. Oh, yeah, where did you get it? I got it from the Lord, mister. Yeah. Well, then where did I get mine from? Well, I don't know. Paul would say, Listen, angel, get out of here. Because he knew what he knew. He knew what he knew. He held to it. Take some of these apostles, Peter, crucified upside down. Take Isaiah, cut asunder from head to foot into two pieces. Take the sufferings of the others in the Old Testament. How could they do it? They heard, they knew. And what they knew, they knew, and nobody could make them unknow it. Some of you have said in this school, I have nobody in mind, of course. I, I, I don't know who anymore. Hallelujah, oh, that's God, that's it. Praise the Lord, oh, that's, yeah, that's it. When I get out, I'm going to, will you? That remains to be seen. Others have sat there and sold out. Can you stand? Can you be Pentecostal outside as well as inside? Or will you trade in promotion for the dynamics of the spirit? Commotion for devotion? Trading in the armor of the Spirit of God for Saul's armor? 
Many are doing it. They find it cheaper. Cheap. One said to me, I find it easier to just go along. Oh yeah? Of course. But God is looking for those who will stand on whom God can depend. Proclaim that which he has put into their hearts. They may shake. Stand. It remains yet to be seen how many of us are going to stand and how many of us are going to fall. And you can be sure not everyone is going to stand. But everyone may stand and can stand given the proper foundation. One more. Verse 47, Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Whosoever cometh to me, relationship, and heareth my sayings, doctrine, and doeth them, lordship. It's not only the knowing, it's the doing. The knowing is absolutely necessary. Of course. But it's not enough. It's the doing. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Ye search the scriptures. They testify of me, but ye will not come unto me. They studied of the Christ to whom they never came. They did not submit their lives to his lordship. <coughs> In Matthew 11, 28, I want to hurry not keep you longer than maybe 15 more minutes. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I'm not speaking along the line Miss Redding would speak on this, uh, and so deliciously well. I want to pick out a principle. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now you go to the book of Jeremiah and you find there that Jeremiah is using the uh, yoke as being symbolic of submission. He took the yoke upon his neck thereby declaring that Judah was to submit themselves to Nebuchadnezzar, the yoke of submission, the recognition of the Lordship of Christ involves submission to his yoke. Hey, the implications here are enormous. You know what a yoke is, don't you? My grandpa was a blacksmith. He was a farmer at the same time. And he put his two cows, they only used cows there for milk and work, and under the yoke, and he puts the yoke on them so he can control them. Look here, I'm not trying to get at anything or anybody. Really, I don't. But look here. If the Lord does not succeed to put a yoke upon us here in the school, what chance is he going to have after we are out of school? Somebody said to me, Brother Buser, at least 40 fellows or 40 students went without permission down to Philadelphia. That number may be a guess. It, if I had the number, I was given the number 40. Well, we know the number is large. To my recollection, we haven't had that in all these years, at least that we know about. And some other things I wouldn't dare mention. Whew. I'd set the bloodhounds going. <laughs> I won't want that. Look 
cares? How do I care? That's the difference. You want to know what the difference is, my friend? The difference is between standing in the storm and collapsing. That's the difference. Well, we're not going to have any roots next year. You've got another guest coming. And then another one still, if you think that. You have another guest coming. Maybe you want to change your application. Take my yoke. Oh, wait a minute, brother. His yoke, yeah, but not the school's yoke. Wait a minute. God, in his providence, has brought you into an environment where there is of necessity a yoke of restriction without which no school could possibly operate, be an impossibility, and no school does operate. And God, in his providence, and I say that not to get at you, please don't, I don't mean that I want to help you. God in his providence brought you under the yoke of the rules to teach you to know what, is the, what, it is, what it is to be yoked in order to bring that uh, lack of restraint and stubbornness and self-will and what goes with it into subjection for the yoke you meet beyond EBI is going to be heavier and more confining than the yoke you have here. Uh, Brother Butler, I disagree with you. When I go out, I can go to bed when I want to. I can eat what I want to. I can go where I want to. Sure you can. But not if you're yoked to him. If you knew the wretched yoke I'm under when I'm overseas, you'd be amazed. Nobody there to force me. No, nobody there. Nobody saying, Brother Buda, you got to do this, you got to do that. Nobody. I set the pace, I set the studies, I tell them what I want. They say, I want a chair and I want to sit and now I get the class to be an hour and a quarter long, then a 15 minute tea break, then another an hour and a quarter. Afternoon I like to rest, even this, and they go along. But hey, in between, what if you sit for seven hours on a plane in Holy Ghost intercession? You can't eat your meal. Just sit there groaning in your spirit all the time. You don't call that a yoke? Try it. When you could run around here and there and yawn. But you know you've got to give yourself to the job that you've got to do for God. So you go to your studies. 17 Bible studies a week in, in uh, a week for five consecutive weeks. There's no time to run around. All you can do is do your work and get some rest and do the praying and do something eating and that's it. Talk about a yoke. Blessed yoke. Blessed yoke. It's easy. Easy. Yes, it's easy. Oh, it's hard on this uh, fuselage. <laughs> but it's easy. Why? Because when you submit your will. You know what makes it hard? Our pressure against the restraints. It's always... Uh, uh, give up. Yes, but I just feel like... <coughs> All right. And the Lord says, I just want to... <coughs> yeah. Do you know that in the final analysis, the yoke of self-discipline is greater than the yoke that others put on us? Submission to his Lordship. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. Take my yoke upon you. 
and learn of me. And you'll find the rest. Have you ever noticed this? That some of our students have no trouble with the rules? The rules don't bother them. Well, laws are made for the lawless if we must use the principle. And the folk who bother the rules most are those folk who have such a spirit of mm, that they constantly clash when others the rules are, uh, don't bother. And the more difficult we have it with the road, the more we reveal our unpunctious nature that yet needs to be brought into subjection. Take my yoke. Whew. I'll better quit her. Not everyone would say it, Lord, Lord. Lord, hallelujah, Lord, 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 glory, Lord, glory. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Not everyone which saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Acknowledging the Lordship of Christ, not merely by word, but by deed. I'd like nothing better than stay home for a summer and watch the grass grow. Nothing better. But I have a yoke. You have a yoke. Many of our conflicts come from constantly straining against the yoke instead of submitting to it. When you submit, it's easy. Oh, it isn't heavy. The heaviness comes from the will that resents the yoke. That's what it is. Lastly, uh, I'll come back to a scripture I have used several times, and I'll, I'll not uh, work at it too much, but merely stir up your remembrance. John 21:18. I have to remind myself of this so often, so don't mind the repetition. Just ask yourself, I know I've heard it, but <laughs> have I ever submitted to it? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. How we talk in our immaturity. I'm going here, I'm going to go there, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Oh yeah? I'm going to be an evangelist, I'll get a pastorate. Oh yeah? And walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands. And another shall gird thee and carry thee with a thou with us not. I won't labor this verse, I'd love to. When we are young, we've got our own ideas. But when thou shalt be old, when thou shalt mature, when you get to know me better, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands in helplessness, in dependence, Another shall gird thee and carry thee, take thee, whether you would never choose by yourself. That's the yoke. That's the submission. Whoso heareth, whoso cometh to me, relationship, and heareth my sayings, Doctor. Uh, what was the other? Doeth them, thank you. He is the one built on a rock, and the winds come, and the waves beat against that light. They hammer away with their thumbs. Could not shake it. Why not? 
for it is founded upon a rock. Shall we stand? Praise be to God. Our Father, these are weighty thoughts and serious contemplations. For we realize that ahead there are things which search against us and which will prove and test the foundation of our house. And Father, we pray that while I little time but also little remains, we shall look well to our foundation that in the days to come we shall stand and not fall to the glory of your name we pray thee. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a chorus I like to sing can we sing it about the chorus from the solid rock me sweating my faith is filled? what God says after. Praise God. I'm wondering in my heart whether there is anyone and this is unusual that feels in need of looking after their foundation by making a new consecration this morning. Is there somebody that would like to put up their hand? There is one and say, Brother Butler, I'm not sure of my foundation. I want to make sure of it. I just have that burden. You know I don't do this usually. Is there anybody else? And there is another one. And the third one. And the fourth one. And the fifth one. I wouldn't do this if I didn't have such a burden. Five hands. Could there be others? I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. We're just going to pray once more while we're together. There were five, is that all? There's a sixth one. I'm so burdened for this, folks. And there's a seventh one. I'm not asking you to march up here unless you want to come later on your own. We're going to pray while we're still standing. That will be all. Is there an eighth one, an eighth one, and a ninth one? Feels so heavy for this thing. I'm not pressing you, just giving the opportunity. Anyone else? There is a tenth one. Mm. 
just think a few weeks were scattered. Only God knows to where. We're going to, will you pray with me just where you stand? My God, my God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Father, Father, our Father, here we stand before thee, so burdened, so concerned. Surely thou art among us with greater concern. Now we want to offer a prayer together for those who have raised their hands in token of the acknowledgement of a need. Father, we thank thee for the working of thy spirit and pray thee that thou wilt undertake in these cases thou dost see the hands thou dost know the needs thou dost know the circumstances thou dost know the winds and the waves that are ahead and even those who cannot see at all what there possibly could be, some of them will soon find how events can suddenly change and blow so hot and so cold. Father, we pray thee that right now Thou will do a new work, a work of strengthening in those lives, that there shall be a speedy coming and a speedy acceptance of that thy yoke and that surrender, that abandonment, O oh God, that shall give them a rooting in thee as it were, so that because of the work of thy word and of thy spirit, they too shall be kept by the power of God. Come what me, and having done all to stand, and standing, someday stand among those who shall stand before thee in the latter days as those who have earned the crown of divine approbation. For thy name's sake we pray thee. Amen. You are dismissed. Any of you who may feel to, you like to tarry in prayer, you do so. My burden hasn't lifted, but I don't know what else to do. Still there.
us into. There there is peace. Hallelujah. Blessed peace, such as only he can give. If thou wouldst only enter into this peace today, if thou would only take upon thyself his yoke, if thou would only submit thyself unto him, then thou wilt know peace, then thou wilt be able to meet the needs of the lost and the dying world. For has it not been spoken unto thee many times, that in this world where there is rushing turmoil, that the world is looking for scientists, that the church is looking for scholars, but God is looking for prophets. If thou wouldst but submit thyself into his omnipotent hand, if thou wouldst but surrender thyself unto him, then thou wouldst know peace, then thou wouldst know this, for it is written there remaineth of this unto the children of God. Submit thyself to him, take thy yoke upon him, pray of him, he is meek and holy. Would he place upon thee a yoke that is so heavy thou wouldst not bear it? Nay, for he loveth thee. Submit thyself unto the hand of thy God, and thy God shall work peace within thy soul, and he shall work life within thy soul, and thou shalt know that thou hast served from God. And thou wilt know that thou hast served the Lord High. Build thy house upon the firm foundation. Hear his word. Do his deed. And thou shalt know, and the world shall know, that thou hast spent with Jesus. You are free to leave or to carry a few moments in prayer just as your desires and your heart would direct you. That will be all.